All right, good morning, everyone. We're live on Facebook, we're live on YouTube. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Way to Health. And today we're joined by Kathy. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. And today we're talking about persistent, excuse me, persistent postural perceptual dizziness. It's a mouthful, we're gonna refer to it as PPPD. Again, persistent postural perceptual dizziness and how someone who's suffering with dizziness would differentiate between this and other causes of dizziness, including MDDS, including vestibular migraines, including Meniere's disease. So we're going to talk about all of that this morning. Now, Kathy, did you have anything before we got rolling? No, I'm just really curious. Like you said, it's a big mouthful. Just exactly what is PPPD? PPPD is actually a new condition that uh, is basically an umbrella condition that used to be chronic subjective dizziness. It used to be phobic postural vertigo, and it used to encompass something called psychophysiological dizziness. So that's what PPPD is. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how do you diagnose it? Really, you diagnose it by ruling out other conditions. And it's interesting that somebody with a vestibular condition can actually still have PPPD. So Meniere's patients can have PPPD. And basically, it's when somebody has this chronic sensation of dizziness. It's present most days of the month. It's triggered by visual motion. So, you know, you're sitting in your car and the car next to you moves. That can be PPPD. Also, there's a increase in dizziness with passive motion. So, you know, somebody turns your chair and you get really dizzy. There's oftentimes associations with anxiety and that's how you really diagnose this condition referred to as PPPD. And good okay, morning to everyone read, who's yeah, joining. To get into that, you've got OCD, mild depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. all those kind of things kind of fall into this? Mm, they do because basically, with dizziness and vertigo in that world, there's a heavy association with anxiety. <clears throat> Chicken or the egg, does the anxiety trigger the dizziness or does the dizziness and vertigo trigger the anxiety? We find that it really goes both ways. And in looking at that, when somebody is dizzy, it creates this fear avoidance syndrome, which is really part and parcel to PPPD. So, you know, you you get turned in your chair and you get really dizzy. That creates anxiety. So then you have anxiety about moving. You have anxiety about people moving past you. And then that further promotes the whole dizziness process and keeps it going and makes it even worse. So that's very much a big part of this, so to speak. So I could see where then mentally the OCD thing, you would want everything in its place because that would kind of throw you off if you were experiencing all that dizziness or any kind of movement put you into that kind of place. So what I read said that, and rather than psychiatric, it's a neuroautologic condition with behavioral elements is kind of what they call it. You say that last part over again, Kathy? What, what I read said it was not psychiatric, mm -hmm. but a neuroautological condition with behavioral elements. Yeah, that's accurate. So it's not completely just an anxiety condition. It is considered a vestibular condition because it has vestibular components where people feel as though they're moving or motion or visual motion causes them to feel dizzy. Because dizziness is not just located down here in the cerebellum and the lower brain, some of the vestibular nerves is also located back here in our parietal lobes. That's where a lot of our our brain's computation, so to speak, of things moving past us is coordinated. That's where we sense, you know, how far our arm is when we're reaching for something. Think of a hockey player hitting a hockey puck. A lot of those functions are back here in the parietal association areas, or to look at it from the side back here. So that's where they're saying, Kathy, you know, really it is a neuroautological condition or a vestibular condition because those areas of the brain are involved, yet anxiety is a big provoking factor for it, particularly when you look at something like phobic postural vertigo. Phobic postural vertigo is where people go up and they're, you know, on the edge of a cliff and they get feeling really dizzy. Well, there's a there's a mismatch there lots of times where they're looking down at the ocean side way far away and the cliff creates that height 
disturbance. So that causes an anxiety reaction, which also causes dizziness. So well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it is involving the vestibular part of the brain, but there is a big dizziness, or excuse me, anxiety component to it. So. Okay, so how do the patients differentiate between PPPD versus Meniere's versus MDDS? So I love this piece because this is really important uh, because a lot of patients searching online are confused about this. So PPPD, again, is this chronic subjective sensation, it used to be chronic subjective dizziness. So it's a subjective sensation of motion or dizziness, lots of times triggered with passive motion, triggered with visual stimuli. So somebody's moving past you, oftentimes associated with anxiety. Something like MDDS, malde de barkman syndrome, typically is triggered, I shouldn't say typically, about half the time is triggered by motion on a boat, on an airplane, in a car, on a curvy road. Somebody is in that circumstance, they come out of those circumstances, and then they feel as though they're rocking or bobbing or weaving and that sensation does not go away, and it lasts longer than a month or seven months, depending on the criteria you're looking at. Now, there's a spontaneous form of MDDS where people just all of a sudden start to feel as though they're rocking and bobbing. Now, in that situation, one would say, well, this is really similar to PPPD. One of the key differentiating factors, and some of you are very astute in knowing this, is that if this individual gets into a car or they're in some sort of environment where they're moving and they feel better, that really points towards non, basically non-motion triggered MDDS is what it's termed. So that really points towards that you have MDDS if you get in a car and it moves and you feel better, now we're talking more MDDS, versus if you get in the car and you feel worse, now we're more talking PPPD. That's basically what the research is showing. But to complicate matters further, uh, researchers who've done a wonderful job, and I'm saying the complication is a good thing, uh, at Mount Sinai <clears throat> in New York at the Human uh, Balance Lab Laboratory, they basically were studying MDDS patients and found that a lot of them have vestibular migraine components, and when they treated them for vestibular migraines, they felt better. So what does that mean? <clears throat> it means that there may be a vestibular migraine pathogenesis, particularly in the non-motion triggered MDDS and possibly even in MDDS patients who have motion triggered. So hopefully you're seeing now kind of how these conditions are separate but overlapping, kind of going down the line. So motion, basically if you have passive motion and you feel worse, PPPD, if you are in a car and you feel better, and you have dizziness, you want to think non-motion triggered MDDS. If you took a boat ride and you've been having this rocking, bobbing sensation ever since, you think motion triggered MDDS. If you have some level of light or sound sensitivity and headaches even at different times from when you're dizzy, associated with your dizziness condition where you may feel like you're rocking or bobbing or maybe you have ex exocentric vertigo as we term it where the room is spinning around you, <clears throat> now we want to think more vestibular migraines, or do you have a history of migraines earlier in life? Now we want to think vestibular migraines versus, hopefully, is everybody with me? You with me, Kathy? I know I'm kind of yes, going am. on here. Yeah. Okay. Let me see here. Okay. Some people had trouble loading the video, but we're good. So now we have Meniere's disease. So Meniere's disease is where someone has vertigo where the room is spinning around them. They have pressure in their ear. They have ringing in their ear. And researchers have found that Meniere's patients also can have attacks of migraines when they have these vertigo attacks, or they may have separate attacks of migraines at different times from the vertigo attacks. So they started doing research and they're finding that a lot of patients were calling Meniere's and may actually have vestibular migraines. And how do we differentiate those two? The current research is showing that if there's a question whether you have vestibular migraines or if you have Meniere's disease, you probably want to start looking at a three Tesla MRI of your inner ear with contrast. Why? Because I'm holding up the diagram of the inner ear. We have this beautiful diagram here. When the inner ear swells, as it does in Meniere's disease, as we've talked about in previous weeks, 
that swelling, they're actually able to start detecting this on MRI scans that have a very powerful magnet and can see things with exquisite detail. So if you have the question, do I have Meniere's or do I have vestibular migraines, I'd really recommend looking into one of these three Tesla MRIs because it should help you to differentiate that matter. Now, in the past, the only way to really differentiate was to do caloric testing, which is where we would inject warm or cold air into the ear, create a convection current in the inner ear, and we'd see is the vestibular apparatus and the nerve damaged. If the vestibular apparatus appears to not be functioning well, then we're talking more something like Meniere's disease. However, researchers have found that when you do this testing and you do VNG testing with the goggles, where Kathy and I have talked about it, we need to do a video just on that. But when you do the testing with the goggles and the caloric testing, even vestibular migraine patients can have abnormalities that mimic Meniere's disease. So that's where it's confusing. Whereas a patient with PPPD really shouldn't have significant abnormalities on their VNG testing. They may have a few, but it's not going to be as demonstrative as what you would see with like vestibular migraines or Meniere's. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, and if it, if it doesn't, then I want to remind the folks of how many of these <clears throat> videos that you've done here lately. We've been doing this whole series on dizziness and vertigo and uh -huh. so forth. So you, you've got a lot of information, what, the last four or five weeks on each of these individual disorders right so folks folks can look at that and when you're talking about the dng which is goggles with the eyes i always laugh because you've got one review on there where the lady talks about getting an eye exam in your office <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which I, I i find amusing because right. she thinks you're checking uh, uh her eyes but we're right. actually checking her brain eye coordination kind of thing exactly and uh, and that that gives you a window into exactly what's going on in her brain and, and everything else almost. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really interesting. Anybody that's experiencing dizziness or vertigo or whatever, I really encourage you to check all those out. And then you'll have a better of idea maybe when you see your physician um, what you're looking for. And you'll be able to give him more information of your symptoms, I would think. No, that's a really good point. And we're not trying to sound egotistical in saying this, but the reality is dizziness is one of the most common reasons why a patient presents to their general practitioner. Unfortunately, dizziness is one of the least understood conditions in the medical community. Even when I talk to patients who see ear, nose, and throat specialists, why is that? And I'm not denigrating the ENTs. Ear, nose, and throat specialists have one of the most complicated jobs in medicine. I think it's important to say that and for you all to know it. When you look at the anatomy of the face and the head and the neck and all the little nerves going through there, it's actually some people would say in the medical community, it is more complicated than neurosurgery. So for an ENT surgeon who may be cutting out really rare tumors from you know, a sinus cavity way deep back in the, in the skull, or they may be cutting out or looking at somebody having a nerve on their glossop or a tumor on their glossopharyngeal nerve, it's very, very exquisite and complicated. And so sometimes, when patients present with dizziness, they don't necessarily feel heard. And I think it's because sometimes ENTs are dealing with seemingly such complicated issues. They may not um, be as excited as a patient wants them to be when they're talking about their dizziness. So I would just say, I feel good about the series that we've done because it's giving all of you a lot of information to talk to your doctors about. And when a patient poses good questions, it makes a doctor think. And I think that's a good thing. And we had a, a post here, Kathy. Well, the vestibular system and limbic system are directly interrelated by directional. And that is absolutely true. So what this listener is saying is that your limbic system, let me see if I can separate the brain, is your emotional regulatory part of your brain. So here is the brain in cross-section. And we have the front part of the brain here. And this is the corpus callosum. As I say every week, it's always so hard to do this backwards. It's like doing it in a mirror. So this white structure here is your corpus callosum. It is a white matter bundle. Think of it as a coaxial cable, so to speak, connecting you know, two continents together. So we have this white matter tract connecting the hemispheres. Around this white matter tract, we have the cingulate gyrus. The cingulate gyrus is very much a critical structure in the limbic system. 
And the cingulate gyrus connects us deep down into the brain to areas like our fear center, our memory area, the memory association areas around the hippocampus. That's your limbic system. Well, also deep down, so here's your parietal lobe right here. Also deep in there, in the temporal lobe is an area or near the temporal lobe is called the insula. So the insula deals with our sensations of our body. It's called introception. And where we're at relative to our surroundings is one function of the insula. So there's another area called the parietal insular vestibular cortex, which is deep in the parietal insular area, deep down in there. And it is an area that encodes where we are relative to our surroundings. It encodes visual motion. It encodes also anxiety signals. So that's where there is the bi-directional relationship between the vestibular system and how our brain computes signals from the inner ear, as I was mentioning before, in the parietal association areas, but also deep down in the limbic system, there are connections as well. So thank you, Alexa, for that comment. And then, did you have anything else, Kathy, before I answer another question? Um, well, we didn't really talk about the underlying cause of PPPD. And that's really good. I would say, hmm, so the underlying cause of PPPD can be multifactorial. So I kind of alluded to it in the beginning that Meniere's patients can have PPPD. People without Meniere's can have PPPD. So the underlying cause of PPPD, I would say, because it is an umbrella condition of phobic postural vertigo, chronic subjective dizziness, psychophysiological dizziness, I oftentimes see an association with the anxiety, which is a lack of blood flow to the brain. So Dr. Below, who's at UCLA, who wrote some fantastic textbooks, he is one of the world's foremost authors and researchers in the vestibular world. He talked a lot about psychophysiological dizziness in his books. Basically with psychophysiological dizziness, when we're anxious, we tend to hyperventilate and we don't even know it. So when you hyperventilate, you're actually breathing off a lot of CO2 and in breathing off a lot of CO2, carbon dioxide, blood vessels to your brain start to constrict. And when you don't have blood flow going to the gray matter of your brain, particularly these association areas, which encode where we're at relative to our surroundings, we start to get nebulous sensations of dizziness. So that's one piece to it, Kathy. <clears throat> in the functional neurology world, we look at how the two sides of your brain are coordinating. So are they functioning the same from side to side? We find lots of times there are asymmetries <clears throat> in how one cerebellum is talking to the opposite side. Well, let me see down here. So your cerebellum back here, how that cerebellum is talking to the contralateral frontal cortex, parietal cortex. And so in my experience, that's a functional cause of PPPD. So that is what I would say. And okay. we had a question. Uh, and in my, read in my reading, it said pre-existing vestibular disorders, mm -hmm. medical illness even, mm -hmm. and the thing you're talking about, the psychological stress. Mm -hmm. um, so those were the three things. And, that, you know, I don't know what medical illness uh, would bring something like that on. It may mean, is it the infection, a viral infection that, that brings that? into being or yeah uh it can be that it can be the inflammation associated with that and this is a really good point so let's use something like Meniere's or let's use something like BPPV so in Meniere's as we were mentioning before that inner ear is swelling so this is swelling in here right here this vestibular apparatus up and down up and down when that happens, your vestibular nerve is getting signals of you know, high signals, low signals, high signals, low signals. That's super confusing for your cerebellum. So now let's say a Meniere's attack is not happening and you're at kind of a resting state for the amount of pressure in your vestibular system. Well, your cerebellum has just been thrown off quite a bit. So it doesn't know what the right signal is. So lots of times people in between Meniere's attacks or even BPPV with the crystals, they will have this sensation of just being dizzy, just being off. So they'll get lumped into PPPD in that situation. So when they're saying vestibular disorders, Kathy, and that light, that's kind of what they're referring to. But really it's because okay. that vestibular disorder decalibrated your cerebellum is how I would say it. And okay. then... Mm -hmm. So is what, what's the treatment for PPPD? 
PD? The treatment really is to work with an underlying vestibular disorder. If it's not there, help your cerebellum to get more balanced, right and left side. If somebody has signs functionally involving their parietal association areas, you wanna work with that. For example, if a doctor says, okay, close your eyes and touch your nose and you don't know where your nose is, that's actually in the functional world, we consider that a problem because your hand and your face is like 50% of the somatosensory cortex here in your brain. So there's a map. I don't know if you all can see that. You can see there's a little bit of writing there. Well, that writing is referring to a map in each area for a part of your body. So the face and the hand is like 50% of our somatosensory cortex. So if you don't know where your nose is, that could be an issue. What if you're a hockey player and all of a sudden you can't shoot goals anymore after a head injury? Well, that's because that part of your parietal association area is not working well. So we tried to glean different signs to different areas of the brain. And then we try to give someone a rehab strategy and exercise for that area of the brain to get it recalibrated. So that's how we really treat it. And treating the underlying anxiety can be beneficial. In the medical world, they're gonna use drugs like SSRIs and SNRIs, think Prozac and Cymbalta. In the functional world, we're gonna use different supplementation strategies to drive things like serotonin or norepinephrine. And then we had some other questions. How can vestibular migraines cause abnormal results on the BNG? Can vestibular migraines cause spontaneous nystagmus? Great question. And the answer is yes. So how can vestibular migraines cause abnormal results on the BNG? And this ties in with the lack of blood flow theory. So before a migraine happens, we have reduced blood flow going into the brain. And if it's a vestibular migraine, that can be affecting your brainstem. And so if we don't have enough blood flow going to the brainstem, those nerve cells are not going to work well. And that is where vestibular migraine patients can present with spontaneous nystagmus. What's nystagmus? That's where your eyes are going to be moving like this one direction. They may be going down really quickly. They may be going up really quickly. You get it. And so vestibular migraine patients can present with that. And that's where in the past, doctors would get really confused with that because they say, oh my gosh, you got a tumor in your brainstem. We've got to get an MRI. They get an MRI and there's no tumor. Well, it's because those cells in your brainstem aren't getting enough oxygen or there's inflammation, accumulation of inflammatory mediators like CGRP or potassium in that region of the brainstem. So that would be, that would be the answer to that. Thank you for that question. And uh, we had another question. Would you say that gluten can exacerbate all these conditions? Love it. And I would say absolutely <laughs> <laughs> for those who are gluten sensitive. 100% on 100%. anything that's out there. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> because gluten, as we have it here. Okay. So gluten, if you have antibodies to gluten, gluten antibodies have definitively been shown in the literature to attack our cerebellum. So Purkinje cells, which are the outer portion of your cerebellum, they do tons of dampening for everything going on in your cerebellum. Just know your cerebellum down here looks small, has as many neurons here as you do in the rest of your brain. So it's very dense and compact. And a lot of those neurons are Purkinje cells. Well, Purkinje cells are attacked by gluten antibodies. So gluten can be a really bad thing for anybody with dizziness. And the whole gluten debate is this ongoing debate for many reasons, but just know 10 to 20% of the population reports that when they eat gluten, they feel worse after they've been on a gluten-free diet. And researchers have been studying and trying to figure out what's going on in the gastrointestinal tract. Actually, the most common cause, or excuse me, the, the most common symptom after eating gluten is low mood or depression. So we find that gluten, you would think, causes a gastrointestinal problem. It actually does. It serves as a poison to the junctions of our intestinal cells. But it more commonly causes brain symptoms because when that gluten opens up our gastrointestinal barrier, then pieces of bacteria can get through or other antibodies are formed and all that inflammation goes into our brain and causes us not to feel well. If you've ever had a cold, do you feel kind of depressed? Most people say, yeah, I just don't feel good. I don't feel confident. Well, that's because all that inflammation is going to your brain. So thank you for that question on gluten. Love it. And what, what about dairy? Does that have any bearing on it? I know it does I, on the sinuses. I would Can it on your ear. On the ear, I would say I've seen that. I think I even saw an article on Meniere's relative to dairy. 
And then that gets into the whole world of GAD antibodies, glutamic acid decarboxylase antibodies. That's an enzyme that basically makes the neurotransmitter GABA. Well, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that shuts off unwanted things. Purkinje cells use a lot of GABA. They produce GABA. That would be a good way to say it. So what we find is that people who have GAD antibodies tend to present with things like vertigo, or they can present with ataxia. And so Kathy and I talked about in our MDDS broadcast, getting GAD antibodies checked, gluten antibodies, thyroid antibodies checked, because we're seeing this to be an issue in a lot of our MDDS patients. Well, GAD antibodies, I say all that to say, GAD antibodies have been shown to be produced by dairy intolerances. So gluten and dairy intolerances trigger GAD antibodies. That was shown in the journal Nutrients in like 2017, I think, or 2015. So point being, yeah, dairy can be a problem. And in my experience, if it's gluten and dairy being a problem, then it can be other things being a problem too. So you may be reacting to tomatoes. You may be reacting to spinach. I don't know. But all these things really have to be looked at for anybody who has these chronic issues, particularly if you've gone on something like a gluten-free diet or a paleo diet and you're still not feeling 100%, you want to be thinking other things. <clears throat> okay. Well, I, okay. feel, I feel good with that. Well, I think that gives us a lot on that. And I would like to thank you, Dr. Gates, because this whole series, when we started on this, you know, as an old lay person, <laughs> Uh, if you thought dizziness, you thought circulation or inner ear infection, something like that. So, I mean, you've opened this up to a whole gamut of things that I don't think a lot of people were aware of. Well, I love your perspective, Kathy, and I'm so appreciative of what you bring because it helps me and it triggers ideas in my mind that I forget about all the time when I'm talking about this stuff. So I so appreciate that we can bounce this off one another. And it seems like as we go through time, we're getting more and more listener engagement and more and more questions. So thank you to everybody who watched this morning and thank you to everybody who posed questions because it helps. And I really feel, I feel good about this, um, what we put out there in terms of dizziness because I think it is going to give people more answers we're getting positive feedback on YouTube because dizziness is one of those conditions where it's just kind of poorly understood and people are told, you know, go to the physical therapist. If, if physical therapy doesn't work, it's like, eh, you know, it's kind of good luck. No, you should, you should <laughs> really be giving some hope to these folks that are listening and, and paying attention to what you have to say because um, like so many of the other chronic conditions that you work with, um, a lot of people don't dig for the answers and right. you're giving people hope that there are answers and, and places that they can turn to, to find some relief because the, the main word we use when you're speaking all the time are these chronic conditions and they're chronic for a reason because people aren't finding any relief. So True. if you can at least True. point them in the right direction or uh, spark some interest so then go, hey, you know, maybe this is what I'm dealing with. I need to do some more research. I need to talk to my doctor. I need to find some answers because it sounds like maybe there's some hope for me. And that's way exactly. that's the way people should be feeling when they listen to you. They should be realizing there is hope. I love it. I love it. Thank you. I appreciate that. And there is hope. Don't quit. Don't quit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, there was a great poem by Edgar Albert Guest that said, uh, Somebody said it couldn't be done, and he with a chuckle replied, maybe it couldn't, but he wouldn't be the one to say so until he tried. So he buckled right in with a trace of a grin on his face. If he worried, he'd hit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that couldn't be done, and he did it. And so that poem embodies something for everybody with chronic illness. Don't give up. Keep searching. Keep digging. Keep prompting your doctors to dig. If we all keep digging, then people shouldn't have to keep suffering. So... Closing comments for part one of the double header. And uh, now we're going to be talking about Sjogren. So we're going to stop this video, take a quick break, and then Kathy and I will be back to talk about Sjogren syndrome and H. pylori. Okay, everybody have a good Saturday if we don't see you. And talk to you soon. Mm -hmm. Ending here and ending there. I need to plug in my eye.